I have been intensively concerned with the question of uh, the origin of life already during my studying time. And that was the time when, when I realized that Darwin's theory proves to be very weak in explanation in this area. So especially in the area of origin of life. And most recently, I have searched the literature for explanations of the origin of oxygen generating metabolism. So, because this, this is a quite peculiar thing, that there, uh, there is 20% of uh, molecular oxygen in our atmosphere. There is no such thing on other planets. Yeah? This is already something that, uh, that, that makes us ponder. And in the following, I will describe some interesting aspects of uh, this. And the usual explanation that uh, can be found in literature is that roughly 2.4 billion years ago, there was a catastrophic rise of oxygen levels in the Earth's atmosphere. And many authors uh, use the term for this hypothetical scenario, they say it's, uh, it is a revolution. Uh, and another popular term um, within this context is inventions. So there must have been biological inventions so that this revolution was made po uh, possible. And it is often applied uh, to biomolecular <coughs> machines that are said to be evolutionary innovations. So, therefore, um, the title of my presentation today is The Great Oxygenation Event, The Greatest Revolution in Biology. So, um, what do we usually think when we hear the word revolution? First of all, um, we, th we certainly think of violent upheavals as they have happened in as they happened in uh, France, Russia, China, and many other countries. Such processes are anything but the chaotic result of a popular will. Usually, they are thoroughly planned attacks on the existing order carried out by intelligent and skilled people. Thus, revolutions are often represented by the heads of the makers. To carry out a revolution, a clear goal must be in mind. You have to devise a strategy. And you have to, know, you have, to have a detailed knowledge of how to proceed. Otherwise, uh, this won't succeed. And finally, uh, you need capable, you need gifted people to carry out this evil work. In other respects, the term revolutions is applied to technical inventions and the consequences of society, uh, for society. For example, the steam engine is often said to have started the industrial revolution. Others would say something similar about, um, for example, the computer or genetic engineering. Again, such things are, uh, such things require thorough planning, the choice of an appropriate stra strategy, and the ability to implement these plans. Obviously, according to the original meaning, revolutions are something unnatural. However, the term revolution is often used in connection with the theory of evolution. Although all the aspects mentioned here are completely foreign to evolution, because evolution does not pursue goals, nor does it apply strategies, and uh, it, it doesn't possess any skills.
So a little, the, um, the term revolution is totally inappropriate for what the authors want to say with respect to evolution. It is quite frequently met in literature. In an inflationary manner, the ter uh, terms such as invent, learn, or create are also applied to matter. It sounds as if the vast majority of scientists are convinced that matter itself has creative properties. In doing so, the researchers are following the tradition of, uh, of thought of Charles Darwin, who also personified forces of, uh, of nature in his books. This is highlighted by the following quote from, uh, from, a, pa uh, from a paper here from Holman Marriott. Uh, they wrote, the intention of oxygenic photosynthesis, the invention of uh, oxygenic photosynthesis and the subsequent rise of atmospheric oxygen approximately 2.4 billion years ago revolutionized the energetic and enzymatic fundamentals of life. So as we can see here, they use the term inventions and revolutions. Though it is totally inappropriate for evolution. In the following, I will show that this main principle of Darwin's thinking, which has become un uh, an unquestioned habit in the communication about evolution, proves to be completely absurd when it comes to explaining the origin of oxygen-producing metabolism. So, um, these are the, the main points I will state here in this, uh, in this presentation. First of all, molecular oxygen, its abundance and uh, its properties. Then I will go on uh, sh shortly showing why actually uh, great the great oxygenation event is absolutely required. It is compelling for evolution. Evolution cannot do without this scenario. And then I will sh shortly state uh, which indications are usually, usually um, presented in order to prove that mm, there should have been um, a great oxygenation event in geology and geobiochemistry. And uh, I will show some assumed causes for the great oxygenation event. And finally, uh, the main point actually is the last one, the difficulty of the conversion of the metabolism which is absolutely required to have uh, a great oxygenation event. Because before the great oxygenation event, the atmosphere must have been devoid of oxygen. So oxygen is not, uh, not a rare element in the universe. Um, if we reg regard the universe as a whole, uh, there we can see that the, the most abundant element is hydrogen. So um, then uh, there is, a, there is um, a, a quite small amount, so comparable to, uh, in comparison to helium or hydrogen, the amount of oxygen is rather small. Uh, and the same is uh, with uh, carbon and nitrogen. But uh, when we regard our planet, this is totally different. And this is peculiar. Uh, in, uh, in the Earth crust, oxygen is the most abundant element. And um, the, second, the second one is silica and then followed by aluminium and um, iron. Also, uh, the Earth's atmosphere uh, is quite full of oxygen, one can say. So the, the, the most abundant mole molecule is nitrogen, followed by 21% of oxygen. Then we have some, uh, a small fraction of noble gases and carbon dioxide. So this is molecular oxygen um, as it is represented by uh, this model. And uh, the main question is actually where does this molecular oxygen come from? Because there is no other planet 
where molecular oxygen um, is um, as common as on Earth. So oxygen is, is a quite reactive molecule. We all know that uh, oxygen is, so molecular oxygen is responsible for uh, wood to burn. Mm. And you also um, surely know the oxyhydrogen reaction. So this is the oxyhydrogen reaction, which is one of the first reaction taught in uh, chemistry lessons at school. I was also fascinated when I first when I when, when I saw this for the first time, this explosion. Yeah. Um, and both reactions, so uh, the combustion um, and um, and also the oxyhydrogen reaction, are exergonic reactions, releasing a lot of energy. And many reactions with oxygen are spontaneous and release a relatively large amount of energy. And it is precise, precisely this property of oxygen that many organisms make use of by temporarily sp uh, storing the energy in the form of energy-rich organic molecules. Uh, the main uh, molecule is ATP, um, adenosine triphosphate. <laughs> The process of respiration can also be seen as um, as a controlled combustion. So here, this energy which is released w within this combustion is uh, safely placed on the organic molecule ATP, and then it is stored. And afterwards, this energy is used for everything that works within the cell. Um, however, oxygen is not only useful, um, oxygen is also dangerous. Actually, it is not the, the oxygen molecule itself that is dangerous, but uh, the reaction products of oxygen that evolve within the cell are dangerous. Um, oxygen reacts with many organic molecules in the cell. And these reactions take place via um, so-called reactive oxygen species. Um, here is, we, can, we can see that this is the, the superoxide, the hydrogen peroxide, and the hydroxyl radical. The most reactive one is the hydroxyl, is clearly the hydroxyl radical. Yeah. In German, you would, you would call this a uh, molecular berserker. Uh, because this, this uh, hydroxyl radical it, it, uh, virtually reacts with everything it uh, uh, comes across. Um, for these uh, reasons, all organisms that use oxygen have protective mechanisms for uh, detoxification. At the center of such mechanisms are enzymes called catalases or peroxidases. This is a catalase. For example, the catalase is responsible for breaking down hydrogen um, peroxide. And for example, people whose bodies uh, are not capable to produce such enzymes um, due to a genetic defect die in early childhood. This is called acatalasia, which is rather more frequent in Japan. The question that immediately arises is how organisms could have evolved in the beginning if oxygen was present in the atmosphere. And because uh, according to what has been said so far, we, we have to conclude that from the viewpoint of evolutionary theory, the first living beings could not have evolved in the presence of oxygen. And um, the idea actually stems from chemists that there was an atmosphere devoid of oxygen at the beginning of Earth's history. The first one to state this idea clearly was Alexander Ivanovich Oparin, a Russian biochemist who worked, um, who started his career roughly in the 20s of 
um, the, 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 the last century. And he, he also formulated some thoughts on what components it, uh, the, the atmosphere, the first atmosphere, might have contained. Among these components were such uh, molecules as uh, water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. However, Oparin's conclusions are based solely on chemical logic. What Oparin uh, never did was uh, to test his theoretical considerations um, thoroughly with experiments. It was not until Stanley Miller put the thoughts of Oparin in practice in a series of experiments in the 1950s. Um, and he performed this uh, famous Miller experiment. I will not uh, re recapitulate everything about this Miller experiment because uh, most of us are surely um, familiar with, uh, with this kind of experiments. Those who are not um, may ask aft uh, afterwards, but the main point is that um, Miller concluded that uh, the beginning of life uh, is impossible in the presence of oxygen, also uh, as a result of, of his experiments. Here is uh, um, a quote from, from one of his papers. As long as the conditions were reducing, reducing means uh, delivering electrons, yeah. uh, as long as the conditions were reducing, amino acids were synthesized. If the conditions were oxidizing, no amino acids were synthesized. These experiments have confirmed the hypothesis that reducing atmospheres are required for the formation of organic compounds in appreciable quantities. So, whenever there's oxygen, no organic molecules will appear. And uh, therefore, the, uh, so this, this shows the necessity of changing the atmosphere from a low oxygen to a high oxygen state uh, and therefore the great oxygenation event is absolutely required for evolutionary theory. And not long after Miller's experiments there were uh, uh, others who um, presented hypotheses about an, uh, an early oxygen-free atmosphere. For example, Bergner and Marshall uh, explained that the great oxygenation event is, requ uh, is required to explain the Cambrian explosion. What they said was, well, there must have been a rise in oxygen and as a result uh, the living beings become, became more complicated and this is why Cambrian explosion came about. Um, well, how about their hypothesis? They stated that first there must have been uh, volcanic exhalations and uh, the first oxygen appeared in, in the atmosphere as a result of uh, photo dissociation of water. So um, harsh UV light um, is able to break down water molecules and this fission leads to the formation of oxygen. Of molecular, of molecular oxygen. And uh, these authors um, presented the idea that this might have been the, the, the event which produced the first oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth. And they simply said that, well, um, at that time the oxygen level was roughly one thousandth of today. This was simply a blind guess. Yeah. And then they moved, uh, they moved on to say that um, then, then there somehow uh, photosynthetic activity appeared uh, on, uh, on early Earth and this caused the first increase in oxygen levels. And now uh, the oxygen level was um, about 100 of today's level. Again, a blind guess. 
And finally, they said that there was a further increase to one tenth of the uh, of, of today's oxygen level, and that was the time when the shielding of the atmosphere by ozone became possible. So there was enough oxygen, so ozone could be produced, and then uh, the living beings on the surface of the Earth, Earth were sh shielded from the harsh UV light. So this is the idea. And um, here's a quote from, from the um, publication. The physical and evolutionary evidence concerning the development of the Earth appears fully to support such a model, which removes the so-called puzzle of the Cambrian exp uh, evolutionary explosion and of certain subsequent radical evolutionary advances. In particular, Consideration of the rise of oxygen permits a view of the history of the Earth in a rather new and more advanced perspective. So what we can already see, it is not that the facts guided uh, the, the creation of, of a hypothesis or a theory. No, it's, it's vice versa. They require an explanation for Cambrian explosion. And uh, here it is. Um, so the the whole work um, is was was highly speculative, and the authors simply wanted to explain the Cambrian explosion and constructed a completely hypothetical scenario. And this is the rough model as it is presented to us today. So uh, what we can see here is the. Uh, this is the time frame of the whole thing, starting um, here four billion years ago. This is the time where uh, life, uh, where, where life, where the first organisms uh, should have evolved. And uh, then it is claimed that there was a carbon and a sur uh, sulfur, sul sulfur cycle. And after that, during roughly one billion years, there was the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. So this is what is claimed today in, in, uh, in literature. And finally, this accumulation of oxygen um, resulted in the great oxygenation event. Uh, this is a very rough model. Actually, what we find, what, what we really find in literature, uh, uh, really totally, uh, are, are totally different scenarios. Some state that this great oxygenation event happened uh, during a time of 10 million years. Others say that it was protracted and lasted 1 billion years. Some say that uh, there was only one wave uh, of oxygen, so uh, the atmosphere was, was nearly flushed with oxygen quite quickly. Others say that there were, uh, there were whiffs of, of oxygen before the actual great oxygenation event. So the models are totally different, and it depends on the proxies the people use or the, the scientists use um, to construct their models. So what is actually what are the, the indications for the great oxygenation event? The, um, the main um, indications that are used are uh, such proxies. So minerals, for example, uh, wh wherever there is organic carbon, it is assumed that this or organic uh, carbon is present because it wasn't oxidized. Because uh, at the time when it was um, stored in uh, in this in this um, um, slice, this organic carbon. Uh, remained there because uh, the atmosphere at the time was devoid of oxygen. Then, for example, um, bended iron formations are uh, regarded as um, in, um, indication for the oxygen uh, for the great oxygen event, because bended iron formations uh, contain a lot of iron um, three, so it is it is an oxidative state iron three. Uh, and this is the highest oxidative state of uh, of iron, and it is assumed that it is present in uh, in, in, such, in certain parts. 
of uh, the geological report because at that time um, the atmosphere was flushed with oxygen. And um, then there are other uh, redox sensitive minerals such as uranite or um, uh, pyrite. However, for example, for pyrite, it is, uh, it is known, meanwhile, it is known that pyrite can be produced by microorganisms. And if pyrite can be produced by microorganisms, it can hardly be a proxy for a great oxygenation event. Because even today, it can be produced somewhere um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the earth. And um, other proxies are so-called uh, isotopic patterns or isotopic anomalies. Those of sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, and selenium. I will not focus on uh, uh, geologic, ge geological questions today because we are here to discuss biology. But whoever is interested in, uh, in such questions can ask me afterwards. Um, um, I, have, I have already given one presentation on the, uh, this topic, so I, I won't discuss this today uh, in depth. Um, what, what can be s stressed, however, is that the conclusions drawn from the proxies rather depend on the view or even the taste of the researcher because they are really different. The models uh, that uh, rely on, on, on different proxies are quite different and even contradictive. So this is what, uh, what I have observed um, during the literature uh, research on, on this topic. It, it strongly depends on, on, which, uh, on which proxy is used, uh, which model uh, finally results. So what is the, uh, the actually interesting question is what is assumed to be the cause for the great oxygenation event? And um, it is often uh, stated that it, 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 uh, uh, there was an evolution or there, sh there should have been an evolution of oxygen producing microorganisms. So things started somehow with um, started with microorganisms who are not capable to, to um, perform photosynthesis and somehow they evolved for, uh, um, uh, photosynthesis apparatus and this photosynthesis apparatus first did not produce uh, did, did not produce any oxygen such organisms um, oxidize iron or, for example, hydrogen, or sulfur, or nitric, uh, or nitric iron, and um, they build up biomass from carbon dioxide. So they uh, assimilate carbon dioxide. So um, it is it is assumed that first of uh, the first step was the evolution of an oxygenic um, photosynthesis, and the second large step was um, the, 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 the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. And we already can see from this, um, from this picture that there is a, already a quite significant difference between these, these organisms. Here we have two apparatus and here we have only one. Or we have, uh, here we have only one photosystem and here we have, we have two photosystems. So, <coughs> In the following, I will show some details on, on this uh, question. So what, is the, what, what are the evolutionary models to explain this change? The first one is the selective loss. It is assumed that um, at first there was, there was a primordial or pr primordial um, photosynthesis uh, system, um, which did not produce any oxygen. Um, it evolved in uh, certain kinds of microorganisms. And then there was um, a duplication of this um, photosystem. And afterwards, um, this evolved to various kinds of organisms. As we will see 
Um, and um, in the following, there are different types of photosystems. There are photosystems of the type one and photosystems of the type two. And in, uh, in oxygenic photosynthesis, both photosystems are combined. And the problems here are um, that um, the, this, this has never been observed. So this is claimed, but such processes have never been observed in, in biology. This is uh, purely hypothetical. So, and uh, a second problem is that organisms such as here, this one, they simply don't exist. Even today, they do not exist. Um, meaning they have the same kind of photosystem, doubling of a photosystem. And also, uh, there is no point in, in this doubling because it, it doesn't, um, uh, it, it doesn't pre present an advantage. There is no evolutionary advantage to have two photosystems of the same kind. And uh, the last one, and this is the, uh, the, the, the largest problem. Um, the step from C to E is, uh, so to say, technically is, uh, is, is extremely demanding. And this is what I will, uh, I will show in, in the next slides. So uh, another model is the fusion model. In the fusion model, it is claimed that um, at first there was this primordial system, the primordial photosystem, and uh, this photosystem evolved into two different kinds. So the type one and type two, and afterwards they were combined so that the um, uh, oxygen producing for the, uh, for, uh, for the synthesis um, evolved. And again, um, the step from C or D to E is extremely demanding. This is, this is the main problem. And also such, such transformations, such changes have never been observed in biology. This is, um, this is hypothetical. So just to explain what we're talking about, um, we know, uh, roughly how, how the engine of our car is working. For example, I have, um, I use two different cars. I have a small car and uh, I have a larger car for uh, the family. And of course, the larger one is a, um, is a diesel engine. And the smaller one is, is a petrol engine. And uh, the way of functioning for, for both of these engines is quite different. So for the diesel engine, we have um, long chain hydrocarbons as, as the fuel, and the fuel is injected into the combustion chamber. And um, the, the energy is re released by auto ignition. It means that there, there is no spark plug uh, required for, um, for, the, um, for the release of energy. In the petrol engine, this is different. The, the fuel are low boil, boiling hydrocarbons. So short chain, uh, short chain hydrocarbons or flammable gases. And the fuel is vaporized in the, in the fresh air before aspiration. And there is a spark plug in this motor. So what is easier? Is it easier to construct a motor anew, or is it easier to take the diesel engine and to transform it to the petrol engine? What is easier? I think it is even easier to construct the petrol en uh, engine than to transform the diesel engine to the petrol uh, engine. No one would do this. Or just imagine, trans transform a petrol engine to, uh, to, to an electromotor. While well, still running. Pardon? While well, the motor is still running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, it, this is exactly exactly the problem. You have to do it while the motor is still running. Yeah. So how about ox uh, an oxygenic photosynthesis? So this is um, uh, these are the components of the an oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, this is the photo. Uh, this is the photosystem. In uh, an oxygenic um, photosynthesis, it can be either type one or type two. The difference between type one and type two are the cofactors that are within this uh, the systems. There are different cofactors, and um, this is a huge complex functioning as a light-driven electron pump. So electrons are excited here. Um, and subsequently, they are transferred uh, via several cofactors to end up at a, at a uh, quinone here. Um, that is then transferred via the, uh, the quinone pool uh, to the complex three. Uh, what is the complex three for? The complex three is a kind of switch. It switches from two electron to one electron transfer. Why is this required? Why do we have to switch from two electron to one electron transfer? Because one electron transfer is uh, much more efficient than two electron transfer. It is, it is uh, chemically, it is much, or physically, it is much quicker. The activation energy is, uh, is much lower. So this is actually uh, more optimal than two electron transfer. But uh, somehow uh, the, the quinone, has uh, has to arrive at the complex three from complex uh, from from the uh, photosystem, or it has to be transferred to, uh, to somewhere else. And this is the problem because one electron transfer via the membrane will induce harm to the membrane. There will be radical reactions, and this won't work. So. The molecules have to be transformed to, uh, to, to, to such molecules that are not radicals. And then they can diffuse via the membrane. So this is required. And um, both the, the photosystem and the complex tree pump protons. Uh, so from, from uh, this side to the other one, and then there is a gradient that uh, finally drives the ATP synthase. So the, the photosynthesis apparatus here uh, doesn't oxidize water, but it can uh, withdraw electrons from different electron-rich compounds such as hydrogen, sulfur, or um, nitri nitric oxide ions. So how about the oxygen photosynthesis? In, uh, um, oxygen, uh, in oxygenic photosynthesis, there are two photosystems. So this is one light-driven pump, and then there is a second one. And the complex three is between them. And then there is also um, this OEC. OEC means oxygen evolving complex. This is needed uh, to split water. So what are the similarities here? The similarities are that um, in, in, this, uh, in a similar way to the N-oxygenic photosynthesis, it uh, this, the system contains light-driven electron pumps. And there is also a complex three that switches from two electron transfer to one electron transfer. And then there is a, uh, a protein, uh, a, a proton gradient that is built up to drive the ATP synthase. So what are the differences? To, gen to generate molecular oxygen, water need to be needs to be oxidized. So there is this uh, oxygen evolving complex. And um, the electrons are withdrawn from, from water 
and then the electrons are transferred to the tyrosine and from the tyrosine they are transferred to the cofactors here where they're where they're, where they are um excitated so where light induced excitation takes place and one main difference between oxygenic photosynthesis and anoxygenic photosynthesis is the mode of electron flow. The electron flow in, ex uh, in anoxygenic photosynthesis is circular. And here it is linear. This is a huge difference. So when we imagine that uh, there has to be an evolution from anoxygenic photosynthesis to oxygenic photosynthesis, the whole flow has to be reorganized from circular to linear. So just to compare both of them, we have here um, in, uh, in the oxygenic photosynthesis, we have five compounds. We have a linear electron flow and we have the, uh, the oxygenic, uh, oxygen evolving complex here. And uh, this is the anoxygenic photosynthesis. There we have three comp components and the cyclic electron flow. So is this uh, is it plausible that this might might be might have happened by by Darwinian evolution by small steps? So this is a, a schematic uh, representation of the photosynthesis and its energies. So here we can see that uh, these, these are uh, energy levels. This is the oxygenic photosynthesis. Here, the, the, the light-induced uh, um, excitation takes place and the electron is pushed towards um, a higher energy. And then it, uh, it, it, uh, it is transferred via several cofactors. And then again, uh, at, at the second pump, it is uh, excited and it, again it is transferred by, by several um, cofactors to end up at N, uh, ADPH at the cofactor. So um, for N oxygenic photosynthesis this is totally different. There we have a cyclic uh, electron flow. So the electron can actually one one single electron could um, um, repeatedly, uh, repeatedly go via this uh, via this uh, system. However, uh, the electrons are also used for for other tasks. And another problem is that, for example, uh, the photosystems occur in very different organisms, as stated here. Uh, oxygenic photosynthesis occurs in uh, cyanobacteria, in algae, in plants, whereas the anoxygenic photosynthesis typically occurs in um, uh, oxygen, uh, uh, so, so bacteria that live without oxygen, anoxygenic bacteria, protobacteria, chloroflexi, um, chlorobi. Uh, and um, the energy level of both photosystems, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, within an oxygenic photosynthesis is uh, quite similar. Here, in the oxygenic photosynthesis, the photos photosystem of type 2 is lowered. So here the, the potential of the whole system, the chemical potential, the redox potential, has been lowered. So we, we have to, to, to ponder, is, is, this, is this feasible for evolution? To change a whole system, huh? to change the redox potential of a whole system. Um, and well, for me, this is simply comparable um, to rebuilding or to, to con converting uh, a, a running engine that you try to rebuild screw by screw. So let's let's take a closer look to the, the photosystem too. 
The photosystem too uh, contains um, these cofactors. There, there are um, um, this is the special pair where we have magnesium ions and uh, where the, the, the light-induced excitation takes place. And uh, the electron is split off from, from water. And the distance between the cofactors, between the components here, is roughly one nanometer. And these, these transfers of the electron are very fast. They take place within picoseconds. Uh, that is why it is talk of uh, quantum tunneling. Uh, I think Nigel will, will also mention such processes in, bio, uh, in biology. This uh, is, is a quite is a quite interesting aspect. And um, these cofactors are um, arranged in a geometrically optimal arrangement. So that means the angle of of this special pair is optimal. Even a slight change um, will will distort the, the whole thing, and this this won't work. So what we need to um, to change or to, to, to evolve to evolve from uh, this this an oxygenic photosynthesis to evolve it to an oxygenic photosynthesis is the integration of the, the, the fo uh, a second photosynthesis or the second photosystem and the oxygen evolving complex. <clears throat> then it is required to couple the energy, uh, the, the electron flow. There has to be uh, a change from a cyclic uh, electron flow to a linear, to, to a linear uh, electron flow. And uh, the potential of all components of photosystem 2 has to be lowered at once. So um, this is this is what uh, evolution requires to go from um, an oxygenic photosynthesis to fo uh, oxygenic photosynthesis. And here are some quotes from from uh, from a paper that discusses the evolution of uh, photosystems. They, uh, they say the following. The building of photosystem, ones, uh, of photosystem one involves a very complicated biogenesis and assembly process that brings all the uh, photosystem one components together to generate the most efficient photochemical machine in nature. Apparently, the process, the, the proteins serve as a scaffold that keeps the pigments in the correct geometry to facilitate fast energy transfer and to prevent excited state quenching. In addition, the protein must play a role in controlling the energy levels of the pigments. So, the, the perfect geometry. How, how will, uh, will this change? Uh, by even slightest uh, slightest changes will distort uh, this this perfect geometry. Um, several genetic, biochemical, and spectroscopic studies have shown that numerous cofactors are important, not only for the function of photosystem one, but also for its structural integrity. So here again we have. Uh, the, the, the argument of irreducible complexity. We have uh, more than 20 components that are required so it functions. Um, the long evolution of the various reaction centers generated more subunits and current complexes contain up to 20 different subunits. Each evolved to maximize, uh, to maximize uh, maximize light absorption and energy conversion under greatly variable light intensities and temperatures and often hostile environments. 
So what do the authors do? They simply claim it happened. And this is what, what you find often in, in these papers. They describe how, uh, how complicated, how incredibly um, sophisticated the system is. And then they simply say, well, it somehow evolved. So this was, this was sort of the, the, the technical part. Yeah, the technical part of photosynthesis, how to reconstruct, how to rebuild uh, one kind of engine to another, screw by screw. And now uh, let's, let's see some, uh, some aspects of the toxicity of oxygen. So um, this, is, uh, this is the way oxygen reacts. First, uh, one electron can be, can be added, then uh, we obtain superoxide from oxygen, and then uh, a second electron is added and two uh, protons so that hydro hydrogen peroxide results. And uh, when, a, when a, a further electron is added, then uh, the result is the hydroxyl radical and a hydroxide ion. Uh, and rea uh, reactive oxygen species, such as superoxide, hydrogen peroxide or hydrox uh, hydroxyl radical are ubiquitous. They are produced when oxygen comes into contact with various organelles. For example, metal ions. It is dangerous to have uh, a high level of uh, iron too in our cells. This is why the take up of iron is, uh, is strictly um, um, but there is a strict border. We cannot take up more than uh, two milligram of iron. This is prohibited by prohibited by our organism because when iron accumulates in the cells, uh, it produces reactive oxygen species. This is why is it why it is toxic. <clears throat> it becomes a catalyst. Uh, for example, copper one is also dangerous. And then there are, for example, um, organic molecules such as hydroquinones and phenazines. These uh, molecular units are contained in, in, in many cofactors. And then there are more than 40 kinds of enzymes such as NADH dehydrogenases within mitochondria. <clears throat> so these molecules are termed um, Reactive oxygen species are ubiquitous within cells. And um, the level has to be strictly controlled. <coughs> now, there was an, an experiment performed with um, E. coli um, bacteria. Uh, the interest was to see how toxic reactive oxygen, uh, oxygen species are. And it was found that it takes only 20 minutes to damage half of all iron sulfur clusters within uh, E. coli bacteria. 20 minutes. And uh, this happens even in the presence of superoxide dismutases. So enzymes breaking down uh, such radicals are present and even under these conditions it takes only 20 minutes that um, all iron sulfur clusters are damaged uh, when the concentration of superoxide is 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 nanomolar. So, and the authors uh, comment on this uh, the following way. They say, this time frame is very short compared to the usual doubling time of cells in natural habitats. And so this situation is tolerable only because cells continuously repair the damaged clusters by reduction and remetallation. There has to be a continuous repair of many biomolecules in, uh, within the cell, otherwise it will simply die within minutes because of oxygen.
So uh, highly efficient systems, uh, repair system and scavenging systems, or say the, the defense line is required. <clears throat> so uh, the, the first one, and uh, maybe the, the most important one, are the scavenging enzymes, such as superoxide dismutase. The superoxide dismutase breaks down superoxides to produce oxygen, uh, so the molecular oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. And the second one is the catalase. The catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide to produce molecular oxygen and water. And these enzymes are highly efficient. The, the rates uh, that the, uh, the, the reactions have are exceptional among enzymes. Um, they are not often met among en uh, enzymes. Usually the enzymatic rate is about 10 to the power of 2 or 10 to the power of 1. And here we have 10 to the power of 6 or 10 to the power of 7. This is a huge difference. And this is required, otherwise uh, this uh, this defense line will be ineffective. Another defense line are vitamins or vitamins. And um, here in this, in this scheme, we see uh, vitamin E and vitamin C. And they're actually linked with each other. Vitamin E uh, scavenges radicals within the membrane because it's hydrophobic. And vitamin C scavenges radicals in the cytoplasm. So in, uh, in aqueous uh, solution. How does it work? Here we have um, this reactive species. This is a, react a reactive oxygen species that is quenched by uh, vitamin, uh, vitamin E. So it withdraws one hydrogen atom. The result is a, a vitamin E semiquinone. And this semiquinone is much less reactive than the reacti uh, reactive oxygen species, which was before. So um, here we have a buffering of uh, reactive oxygen species already in this first step. And uh, at the interface between the membrane and the aqueous solution, there is the reaction uh, the reaction between vitamin C and vitamin E takes place. So uh, vitamin C is oxidized by vitamin E, producing a semiquinone. And this reaction happens a second time so that the, the, the semiquinone um, becomes a, a quinone, vitamin C quinone. And this quinone then in turn is, uh, is produced by a glutathione. Glutathions are um, um, structures that are similar to amino acids and uh, this, this is a highly efficient system to um, the buffer reactive oxygen species and to eliminate them. Another, systems, an, another sim system that is especially found in bacteria are so-called uh, <coughs> regulons. These are proteins that uh, function as, um, that, that can sense uh, reactive oxygen species. Um, what they do is they, they, they can take on an, uh, an inactivated form or an activated form. So for example, here this oxy-R um, regulon can be uh, transformed in, in an activated form by reactive oxygen species. And what it does is it, it activates the, the synthesis of catalases and uh, superoxide dismutases. So it, is, it acts as an activator. It is a protein that activates um, the synthesis of other proteins, meaning the, the, the um, catalysts that break down um, reactive oxygen species. <coughs> A 
another uh, another possibility is that um, that this system works the other way around. So, for for example, there is uh, there is a regulon known to be inactivated by reactive oxygen species. So this pair R usually blocks the synthesis of catalases and superoxide dismutases. And when, uh, whenever there, there are reactive oxygen species, um, it, is, it is inactivated and uh, dissociates, it, it dissociates from the DNA and allows the synthesis of catalases and superoxide dismutases. And then there are also, there are even sensors for uh, organic compounds. So organic compounds such as phenazines that, um, that accelerate the production of reactive oxygen species. So uh, whenever this SOXR comes into contact with uh, redox cycling compounds, so organic molecules that catalyze the synthesis of <coughs> um, reactive oxygen species, whenever it comes into contact with, with such organic molecules, it uh, becomes activated. And again, it promotes the synthesis of catalases and superoxide dismutases. So this is, this is another um, system that, that is devised as a defense line against uh, oxidative stress. And then <clears throat> there is a repair. There are re repair systems. For example, proteins can be repaired by chaperones. Chaperones are usually intrinsically disordered proteins and they use ATP to remodel or to, uh, to repair proteins that, are, uh, that, ha that have lost the functional form. And uh, denaturated proteins tend to aggregate and to form plaques. And this is, this is highly toxic. And there is also, uh, there is also um, a system that avoids uh, this, this kind of thing. It is called poly-P. This is fo polyphosphate. There are enzymes in, uh, in our cells that produce polyphosphates. Why, why are the there are, there are polyphosphates, they wrap around uh, these enzymes. So they wrap around denaturated enzymes and they prevent aggregation. And again, these kinases are regulated, are strictly regulated by other uh, enzymes. <clears throat> and this depends again on the, the level of reactive oxygen species. Um, this is, this is a question that uh, requires another talk, the repair of DNA. So um, I will skip this today, but uh, it is sufficient to mention that it is, it, it is much more complicated than uh, the repair of proteins. And uh, I will just finish by saying that all defense lines that I have briefly described here are required as soon as there are reactive oxygen species. As soon as they evolve, we need all these defense lines. Otherwise, the organism will quickly die. So um, I will summarize um, briefly what are the requirements for the greatest revolution in biology. It is required to convert an oxygenic photosynthesis to oxygenic, which is technically extremely demanding. And the second one is that it is, it is required that there are immediately multi, multifaceted molecular defense um, lines against oxygen after its <coughs> emergence. Mm. Scavengers, sensors, uh, protection systems such as uh, polyphosphates and repair systems are required. Otherwise, the organism won't survive. As we have seen, both processes are not even remotely feasible for Darwinian evolution. 
Rather, aspects such as perfect functioning, irreducible complexity, and the unmistakable purposefulness of biomolecular constructs speak clearly for creation as the only plausible explanation. Wenn Ihnen unser Video gefallen hat, dann können Sie uns auf drei Arten und Weisen unterstützen. Erstens Abo dalassen, Glocke aktivieren und Link teilen. Zweitens, ganz wichtig für unsere Arbeit, beten, dass wir das weitergeben, was Gott möchte. Oder drittens, Sie können auch spenden, denn unsere Arbeit ist spendenbasiert. Vielen herzlichen Dank.